Hi. In this part, we are going to set up a small test cluster using K3S. Um, we could go with like one of the cloud providers like Google or Azure or AWS and spin up a managed cluster over there. But from my experience, it's better to test if you run the stuff on your own. And this would also give you the option, for example, if you do not have a lot of money, you can just um, run it inside virtual machines. So in this scenario, I will be using VirtualBox. I have three virtual machines running. Each has um, Debian installed. So it should be Debian 10, yeah, the last version. And I'm running the 64-bit one. Um, each of these use a bridged adapter. I've allocated four gigabytes of RAM and 20 gigabytes of disk space to them. Um, they are all bridged, so they are in my main local um, slash 24 subnet, and they will have these three IPs. Um, all we need inside these virtual machines is sudo and curl, because when we install, we'll be using a tool called Ketchup, and Ketchup requires curl and sudo to be installed. Um, I've also changed my slash etc sudo as config, and I've enabled the sudo group and changed it so it does not require me to input any password. And um, I've installed the virtual machines with the user lurken, and so I am also adding the user lurken to the sudo group with that command. Basically, you run these commands on the three virtual machines. And then I copy over my SSH key. I do that by using the SSH copy ID. I specify the password. And from that moment on, I can log on to the K3S servers by just using SSH keys for authentication. And we'll need that for Ketchup to run. So it's pronounced Ketchup. At least that's what they say on the GitHub page. And it's just a lightweight utility. So you can basically spin up um, your Kubernetes nodes, uh, in particular for K3S. And um, K3S is a little bit different than Kubernetes. It's basically using Kubernetes and they um, used all the functionality that is in Kubernetes, but is disabled by default and remove that. And then they packaged all the Kubernetes components into a single binary, which then can be run easily. And they also extended it so it supports the ARM architecture. So you could actually um, run these on Raspberry Pis, for example. So you could just buy three Raspberry Pis, put them in a network, um, install K3S on these, and these that would be a ideal environment for just some local testing. OK, so next step would be to install K3S up on my uh, local workstation. So we're just running these two commands. The first one will download the script, execute it, and then copy over the binary into our uh, user local bin. And from that moment on, I can use it. I am currently on version 096. And then we can basically start using K3S or Ketchup to um, set up our three servers. So let me copy paste the command that we would be using to set up the first one. So we run a, a catch-up install, and we specify the version. I'll be picking version 1.19. Uh, earlier versions of K3S used SQLite. The main difference here is that this one uses a etcd as a uh, key value storage. I then specify the server IP of the first server. The user I created my virtual machine with and that I'll be using to log in. So K3S sub will be using basically my SSH key to get into the virtual machine, specify a cluster, and then we pass on some K3S extra arcs. You don't need these by default, but um, for what I want to do, um, these will come in handy later on. So the first is that I specify no deploy traffic. Traffic is a ingress controller, which we earlier learned is to um, basically route traffic from the outside world to the services or to the pods. And I don't want traffic. I want to use the Nginx-based one. So I'll um, remove it from the installation. And then we just specify the bind address, the advertise address, and the node IPs. 
which is basically so the K3S nodes can use these to communicate to one another um, over the internal network. And then you would have the node external IP, um, which is kind of interesting if you run your um, own K3S cluster. So basically, based on what you said here, um, the Kubernetes cluster will store that as a external IP. So um, let's say my um, current internet IP is 1234, and I want to expose something over that. Um, it's sort of a hacky way to do it, but you would um, define the node external IP to be your public IP. And from that on, all services will derive and use that as a public IP. And that way you can, for example, use that later on with, with um, containers like external DNS. But we'll get more into that later on. So for now, um, just think if you have a virtual machine um, and you run the cluster in there, just use your public IP. If you have servers um, and these servers have public IPs, use the public IPs of the servers. OK, so we will be running that. That basically connects to our virtual machine and then starts downloading the single binary. Then it checks it, and it also creates a systemd startup service called k3s and writes this to this file. So if we want to change any of the arguments later on, we can just do that by editing the systemd file and changing the arguments in there and then restarting the services. So what it then does, it, it creates our cluster and it then creates a cube config. And this cube config will be saved in your home folder locally on your system. So with that, we can then use cube control, which um, you should already have installed, I guess. Um, if not, it's quite easy to install. Just Google for it. And then we can start interacting with the cluster. Um, so if we look inside the file, uh, we will see that um, we basically have the certificate data for our cluster, and we have a client certificate and a client key. And that allows us to authenticate to the API. And the API endpoint is basically a service hosted on the first node that we set up. So I can now run a cube control, get nodes, and that will, oh, no, I am still connected to my other cluster. So I first has to do a export cube config equals home local cube config. So if I do that, I tell um, my operating system, so whenever I run the kube control command, it should take a look at this kube config file for the connection informations. So if I now run kube control get node, I now get my first K3S01. And it's running version 119, and it's been alive for 90 seconds. OK, so that was rather easy to get our cluster up and running. Um, well, it's the first node of the cluster, and now we basically have to add in the other ones. So what we can also do is um, kubectl get node minus o white. That will give us all the information. And you can now see that it set the external IP to one two three four for this specific node. So if we then later on do or create any services on that, we can then derive that external IP and use that later on. So now I would basically copy over the command for the second server. It's pretty similar. Again, we don't use the install. We use the join. We specify the version. And then we point to the IP. And then we give it another flag, which is the server IP. And that points to the first server that we set up. So basically, it will then tell it um, the second server to talk to the first server. And then they form a cluster. Um, same flags over here, and we pass on extra arcs. And again, the same. We do not want the ingress. We specify the um, IPs for this node, and again, the external IP. And again, it's doing the same, downloading the binary, creating the service file with slightly different arguments, and then starting that up too.
And if we run it again, we can now see we have two nodes and both of them should have the external IP. It sometimes takes a little bit for it to update, but it will get there later on. Okay, so now we have two nodes up and now let's do the third one. Okay, so that will be the same. We now specify the third IP and point again at the first server and then the same arguments as we used before. Okay, so that has been created too. And if we check again, we can now see that the external IP has populated on the second one and will soon also be populated on the third. So we now have all the clusters, uh, cluster nodes up that we need. Okay, so the next step that I want is to install the Kubernetes dashboard, which gives us a graphical user interface to check on our nodes and the states. And we can basically just grab that from GitHub and we simply run a kube control apply minus F. So that basically tells the cluster to apply the configuration which is stored at this location. So that created quite a few things, like we have a service account, a Kubernetes dash dashboard, and all the stuff um, that it needs to run. So we can already see that quite a few things are starting to run, and we'll get more into these later on. So what we would also need is a user account, so we can run a cube control get service account. And we have one default service account, but we want a another account. So I am now creating a file called dashboard minus admin dot YAML. And I'll be copying over a configuration for a service account. And similar to applying links, you can also apply local files. And that now creates a admin user service account for us in the Kubernetes dashboard uh, namespace. So we also need a admin role. We'll get more into the permission schemes later on, but um, for now we just need to load this sort of. So this is creating a cluster role binding. So basically a role across the whole cluster that our admin user can access what it needs to access. And again, we apply the config So once that is done, it would then create a secret secret. So you will see um, the Kubernetes API has a very simple structure. You always have um, cube control and then get, show, describe, uh, stuff like that, like verbs, and then what you want to describe. And minus n um, describes the namespace we are in. So basically that created a token and a secret and we can extract that by basically using this command. So again, we specify the Kubernetes dashboard namespace and we describe the secret for our admin user token and then we grab for the token and that will give us a token which we copy. So we now want to access our Kubernetes dashboard and we do this by um, opening a tunnel to our Kubernetes server, which is specified in our um, config. 
So we basically create a sort of tunnel to this server endpoint by using kube control proxy. And that tunnel will be available on the local host on port 8001. So we head over there. And that will give us a API endpoint that we can query. Let's see if I have that saved. No, I don't have that saved. So I will first need to copy the whole URL path. So this is the generic APIs endpoint and those are all the available resources. And we are going inside one of these and into the version one namespaces into our Kubernetes dashboard. And this is how we can actually view our Kubernetes dashboard. So it now asks us to specify a token to log in, and that is where we need the token that we previously extracted. So this one, and we can enter that here and click on sign in. And now I would recommend you to update the password because it will get annoying to having to input um, the token over and over again. But yeah, that is basically a dashboard and that dashboard gives you access to all the different resources. So for example, we could go to the notes section and in here we can see all of our three nodes and what they are using. So you can see um, node one is already using a little bit of memory and that's for the stuff that we already loaded for running the dashboard and stuff like that. Yeah, we could also go to the pods, for example, and take a look. So nothing is running here, but in the dashboard, you can also um, change the namespace. For example, we can go to the Kubernetes dashboard namespace, and then we can see the pods that are currently running to actually host the um, dashboard that we are using. So in the next couple of stacks um, videos, we will go more into different parts of these different components and see how they work. Talk to you soon.